been here in a hot minute. In fact, I haven't been online in a hot minute, so I probably have some explaining to do. This is going to be a paranormal podcast for those of you that are brave enough to join the circle. It's a lifestyle podcast today, so stick around. If not, that's okay too. It's been a pretty crazy six months. I almost quit social media, if I'm being completely honest. And I know that's kind of a staggering statement. I went through a major transformation in the past six months and I was not planning on sharing it. Probably about a month ago, I had a dream from my spirit guides and my spirit team and they said, um, if you don't share this with your collective on earth, you are doing them a major disservice. And they said, but it's up to you. And I woke up feeling a lot of like immense guilt over that. Sort of this roller coaster that I've been on for the past, you know, since February essentially. And so I have a lot to fill you in on. I know I sort of you know, went ghost and sort of disappeared for a while. A majority of you are going to tune into this on my podcast. My podcast is my biggest platform. I'm very you know, grateful to you guys for that. I, I still have thousands of downloads every month, even though I haven't been uploading. Um, so I, I, I appreciate you all. Uh, so I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be very honest because you guys know that I wear my heart on my sleeve. And um, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'm just going to tell you everything as it is because my spirit team told me that someone out there may need to hear this. So we're going to get a little deep today. We're going to get a little deep. We're going to talk about this sort of transformation that I went through for the last six months. I call it my like final metamorphosis, uh, Phoenix Rising moment. I wouldn't have come back to social media if it wouldn't have been for some really, you know, wonderful people that I have in my life. When I you know, was a producer and when I was working in LA, I did make friends with some A-list celebrities and I never name dropped them. Uh, and I'm not talking about anybody in paranormal. I'm, uh, these are people way bigger than that. They gave me sort of this umph to get back up and keep going. And, and you know, one of them, one of my dear friends said to me, Crystal, like Hollywood's a doggy dog industry. Like they're gonna chew you up and spit you up a thousand times. And you know, that last time you didn't get up may have been that one time that was gonna be you know, your make it moment. And so she was like, get back up. She's like, um, you know, don't give up on Ghost Girl Diaries. Don't give up on your dream. It's not over yet. And so because of what she said to me, uh, I got back up. I've recorded this video probably seven times and I haven't, I haven't posted it. And I haven't posted it because I keep feeling like I don't have the right words to say. I keep feeling like I'm not, um, relaying the messages correctly of what I've gone through and my spirit team was like stop you're overthinking just just say it and I was like okay all right I will so we're gonna do it I've had a lot of human interaction uh with like spirit guides where they show up in your 3d where like random people on the street will show up in angel form and they'll walk up to you and say something really like predominant that just happens to be something you're going through in your mind at that moment I went in Walmart a few months ago and this like 70 year old black man came walking up to me right out of nowhere and he goes young lady I need to have a have a word with you I was nervous because I thought that he assumed I was stealing something because I look alternative and I was like uh oh he's gonna be upset with me for you know unknown reasons and he goes, young lady, I have to tell you something. He goes, your spirit team is very strong and they're standing behind you and they told me to talk to you. And I said, oh, okay. I was diagnosed with cancer, I'm 72 years old. And he goes, you know, the doctor told me you need to start chemo and radiation treatment and all this stuff. And he goes, I said, no, I'm not doing that. And the doctor said, what do you mean? And he goes, if I came in this world and God let me, then I'll go out of this world if God's requesting me and requiring me home. And I got kind of teary-eyed and he, he left the hospital that day and he said I never went back for any cancer treatments. And um, he basically cut out like sugar and went on like an extreme like vegetarian diet, started drinking like bottled water and essentially eliminated the cancer cells. He went back a few months later and they couldn't find cancer. And the doctors were dumbfounded because he didn't go through any treatments and he said, you know, the doctor just looked at me confused and I said, I told you, I told you that if God wanted to take me, he would have taken me and he said it wasn't my time. And he, lo and he looked at me and I was just like really shocked that this stranger out of the blue, this 72 year old black man walked up to me out of nowhere. 
by the way, he did not look 72. He looked great for his age. But he said, um, you know, the moral of this story and what I'm supposed to tell you is if there are people, places, and things that irritate your spirit or your soul, eliminate them because they are bad for your health. He goes, and it was weird because at the time I was convinced I was having a gluten allergy. Okay, like I've always had gluten problems and I had been, I got, t I got allergy tests for gluten. It wasn't coming back that I was allergic to gluten, but I could swear up and down I was allergic to gluten every time I, and I love pasta. Okay, like I could eat, I'm, I should have been Italian. Like I, I could eat pasta 24 seven, right? But it makes me like sick, severely sick. And he, so it was weird that he brought that up. He's like, yeah, people, places, and things, he's like, eliminate it if it's not good for you. And I was like, wow. And at the time, I was still sort of navigating this new life without some really close friendships in my life. He goes, you'll know if something doesn't feel right for you and eliminate it. Don't ask questions, just do it. But it was really uh, powerful. And I've had several of those interactions that have happened, you know, in the last six months. I was turning from this caterpillar into you know, an actual butterfly. And I had a lot of friends that did not like that I had emerged from the darkness. And um, I was really hurt by a lot of people that were very close in my life that I had to remove because they were really dark for me. I was also concerned at the same time because I had some cousins come out of the woodwork. If you've been following me for a while, you know that I've eliminated a lot of my family many years ago. I was the black sheep of my family. Uh, they hated me for numerous reasons, mainly because of my sobriety. Um, and so when these cousins started reaching out in February, I just knew it was a matter of time before they started telling the whole family who I was. Basically, my cousins and my family, none of them knew about Ghost Girl Diaries. None of them know about my filmmaking. None of them probably even knew I moved to Los Angeles. I bet they don't even know if I live in Las Vegas, honestly. Like, that's how much of a strange relationship we have. They came out of the woodwork one by one, and it ended up going into my part of my dad's side of the family as well. And they started contact me, contacting me to the point of almost harassment. Um, it was almost daily. I would block them. They would create new um, profiles. And it, I just had this like gut instinct that it wasn't going to be a good interaction. And it, it went from, hey, how are you, to manipulation of, I need you to call me, I need help, which was a tactic that used to work on my mom because they all have drug problems and financial problems. And my mom would jump up and call and help them and send them money and wire them money. And I think that because my mom's gone, they don't have that outlet anymore. And you know, take in mind through this contact that they're all emailing me and messaging me, one, none of them have given me condolences for my mother, not once. They knew she died, they knew how she died. None of them gave me condolences. And then two, I haven't spoke to these people in like over 15 years. Like it's been a very long time. And um, they're strangers to me is really the only way, the only, way that I can word it is these people are strangers but it turned into manipulation then it turned into begging me for money begging me for help then they started messaging fans that were you know leaving me comments on social media and they were harassing fans and um, I shut down I completely shut down because not only did I feel like abandoned by a large like eight of my friends that just didn't want me to emerge from the darkness some of my best friends in fact but I also had my family coming out of the woodwork. Um, and it was people that I, I just wished they would go away. I wish they'd never find me. My guides told me I needed to explain why I was the black sheep. And I've probably skimmed over this a few times and addressed it a little bit. My family essentially like, you know, exiled me from the family at 13. I was you know, my, my grandmother, my mother, and, and myself were really the only sober ones in my family. I never did drugs. I never tried drugs. My aunt was an alcoholic, and then she just sort of passed, you know, the alcoholism trait to the rest of the family. So I grew up watching my aunt essentially slowly die from her alcoholism. And um, unfortunately, because I am indigenous, it is very, very common for, you know, 
ancestral trauma in indigenous families to have severe you know alcohol dependence and drug dependence issues because of generational trauma and my family is no different and they didn't understand how I didn't need drugs to get high on life they didn't understand why I enjoyed my life sober that I didn't need to feel a certain way to be excited about something and because they couldn't peer pressure me I just became exiled slowly and it really happened at the age of 13 like I just remember alcohol was slowly introduced to my cousins and then it became drugs and it was like you know the gate gateway drugs and it just got worse and worse and most of my cousins ended up on meth and most of them lost their teeth and I honestly don't even know how they're alive to this day. Some of my cousins look like they're 90 years old and they're not um, from being on drugs for so long. And, um, you know, they made my life hell when I was a kid, when I was 13 years old. I, 13 years old was a very pivotal year for me. I also had a friend, if you've read my book, I had a friend that committed suicide. It was one of my best friends and I should have been in therapy and I wasn't but I was in a really dark place that was really when I started um, learning more about paranormal and the other side and to put it bluntly that's where I became fascinated with death I never became fascinated with death enough to actually die but I wanted to know where you went because my friend was gone and I just went to a dark place you know at the age of 13 was really when my alternative goth phase started and on top of that, you know, I can't really escape it at, ho at school because my friend died. And then at home, I'm just being completely bullied um, from my cousins. Like, I had a couple of cousins that would, like, try to beat the crap out of me. And, you know, I've said this in podcasts before, but I'd be standing in my aunt's kitchen. Like, I feel like I'm having a flashback right now. Like, I'd be standing in my aunt's kitchen and I would just be minding my own business and not paying attention to my surroundings and one of my cousins would just come up and sock me in the face and like I mean really hook me right in the face and knock me down and um, I mean my cousins were smaller than me so I would oftentimes overpower them I was also very fit because I was a cheerleader but that wasn't a fun thing to experience so I was constantly on uh, fight or flight around my family because the toxicity that went in you know my cousins that had drug problems and I was also you know my mom was constantly trying to save them they were always in and out of jail I told you guys that my mom and I went homeless a couple of times we lived out of her car a few times because um, she was busy bailing people out of jail because of drugs and I guess at the time I couldn't understand why she wasn't just you know don't spend your rent money on my dysfunctional family make sure that I have a roof over my head like I'm too little to figure out how to make you know money to, to have a roof over my head like so it, it created a lot of uncertainty unsafety in my life my mother was a great mom she was sober she just felt like she could save everybody I used to say um, she had mother Teresa syndrome that she felt like she just had this magical touch and she could heal and save everybody and I think that to this day my cousins are just used to her always being there because up until she died she was still doing things for them she was still wiring them money she was still sending them money and I think that now that she's been gone for a few years the next person they look at is me and you know I started getting these threatening messages from them where they're like we're watching your social media like we're watching everything you say where we hear everything you say about us and it just took me back I had to do a lot of shadow work the last six months I didn't realize I had a lot of um, unhealed trauma from them and it was weird because I was having like internal dialogue with myself where I was saying like you know I'm really unfazed by haters online right I'm very unfazed, like, you know, when Ghost Girl Diaries was in its prime, like, on YouTube, I had millions of views going, right? Like, you guys know that, who've been watching me on the old YouTube channel, right? And I got bloggers writing, you know, crap about me, uh, tabloids writing crap about me, 
locals writing crap about me, like people saying I'm dating celebrities that I'm not that live in Las Vegas, people saying I'm stalking ce celebrities that I'm not that live in Las Vegas, like all kinds of hurtful things um, just because I have ties into like the paranormal community and um, it didn't phase me. Like I'm going to be honest, like I have an eighth house moon. Um, I have an Aquarius moon, so I'm very private. Eighth house is usually like taboo secrets. So I keep my relationships very private. So oddly, when hurtful things are said about me online, especially like in context of relationships, I laugh because I'm so private of what's going on currently in my life that whatever tabloids are saying or people are saying online about me isn't true and it actually makes me happy because it makes me realize they're like way over in left field and they actually don't know what's going on and if that means protecting my private life like people didn't know I was married for most of the time on YouTube people didn't know I was a stepmother and I had two stepkids and the reason I wasn't talking about my marriage was to protect them because sometimes I would get stalkers and men would just show up to my door and you know the kids of the mothers of the my two stepkids were concerned for their safety right like so they were like please don't talk about you know their names them like so I so people don't even know there's like a whole side of me that people don't even know Meanwhile, there's all these people just spreading rumors and trash online and I'm just letting them because I would rather they were spreading those rumors online about me if that meant keeping my stepkids safe, right? But it also created this really hard shell of like an alligator skin. Like, you know, I have a lot of friends that are influencers now. Like, I mean, bigger than me. I only have 60,000 on TikTok, but I have friends with 200,000, even millions of followers, okay? And they cannot handle the heat from the hate you get online. It doesn't bother me. And I, I figured out that it doesn't bother me because of how bullied I was from my family when I was 13. And I realized that the only people that could really break me down and tear me down are my family. And so when I started getting these threatening messages and like they're watching everything I do, like I shut down and I was like, I'm not uploading ever again. I'm not going to upload any content ever again. If they're watching me, they're watching everything I do. Like it made me physically violent. It made me feel physically sick because I don't want them to know what's going on in my life. I don't want to know them. I don't care. Like I just don't care. I, I've been disconnected from them for so long and I don't have fond memories. You know, like it sucks because... I have beautiful memories of my cousins and I when we were little, like probably up till we were 10 or until, at least till I was 10 and then alcohol and drugs started getting involved and I did I don't have fond memories after that. And I think that maybe they still hang on to those memories and I don't. I can't I can't outweigh the times I went, you know, my aunts, my aunt and my mom asked me to go into the sewers of Denver and pull out my cousins who were like tweaking out of their mind and almost overdosing and dying and they were living on the streets and I would have to go with my boyfriend to go find them and and pull them out of the streets and like those are the memories that I have that linger in my forefront not the happy memories of us as, as kids and you know just seeing them all strung out like I remember how miserable holidays were you know like I remember you know, my mom was sober, my grandma was sober, I was sober, and that was it. Nobody else was sober. My uncle, one of my uncles was sober, and that was it. And everyone's just tweaking. They're going in my mom's bathroom, and they're snorting, you know, up their nose. And, like, I just, I was like, why am I living, like, how in the hell did I incarnate into a family like this? When I am so, like, anti-drugs, I've never done drugs, I don't do, like, and look, if you live a life of sobriety and you've come out of it, I applaud you for that, right? Like, I don't judge anybody that's overcome sobriety, but I do judge my family who, I mean, they ruined our family. Our family is totally ruined because of the drug and alcoholism issue that was so widespread in my family. And I don't have fond memories. I, I have memories of living in my car because of the drug and alcoholism and, and my mom was the only sober one able to go around and save everyone she was essentially trying to you know help my grandmother be the matriarch of the family and and keep the family together and in the process of that I suffered and I suffered a lot and you know so for these people to come out and start threatening me I had this really rough moment where I just I had to shut everything down and go into hiding I had to go into hiding and I was still uploading a little bit, but not a lot. 
and it was because I had this fear they were watching and I know they're going to probably listen to this or watch this. They know my success now. They know, you know, me being a filmmaker, they know Travel Channel, they know Ghost Girl Diaries, they know everything. And I had to have this really like in-depth conversation with myself where I was like, you overcame them as a child. Like when I turned 18, 19, I said, I'll never speak to them again. And I meant it. And I did. I never spoke to him again. And I'm like, I'm not revisiting this. Like, you have a choice. Do you want to let these people back in or not? But remember, like, to me, like, you can probably see me on camera, like, physically shutting down. Like, they make me physically tremble because of how dysfunctional they are. And I was like, if I let them back in, my life is going to be destroyed. And I, my mom, you know, even before her deathbed, she said to me, don't ever let those people come back in your life protect yourself she said that to me and and I take it very very serious and um, I really had to work through some shadows of like are you going to let them haunt you and ruin your life again and the answer is no I'm not going to sit here and be complacent and shut my social media off and my empire and everything I've worked for and PS you haven't seen the best of what's coming yet right like I'm just about to get back up again this was a big test from the universe to see if they could knock me down. And they may have knocked me down for a little bit. You know, and that's my resiliency. When I overcome things in life, you, I might get knocked down. Like, and I might get knocked down for quite a while. Like, my mom's death and her murder, it knocked me down. It knocked me down for a bit, but I will get back up. It might take me some time to catch my breath, but I will get back up. I am very stubborn. I have five placements in Aries in my 10th house of career. You cannot mess me. I am I'm a fiery fireball. Like you're not going to stop me, you know? I really just went back. I I had contacted one of my cousins when my mother died, right? And I knew this one cousin would tell the rest of the family cuz I thought I at least owed them that. And I told my cousin, I said, you know, my mom was killed and this is what happened and she was on the phone with me, and she was probably on drugs. She was pregnant. She was screaming at me, told me that I was lying, said that I was making it up, like how she died. And she told me that I was making this up to take the attention away from her being pregnant. And essentially that she wasn't going to tell everybody what I said because I was, I was being dramatic and I was making it up. That's how my family treats me. And then two years later, I turn around and this, uh, this person also messages me again and says, oh, I have a son now, he's two years old, blah, blah, blah. I'd love for you to be a part of his life. No apology, no accountability for what they've done. You know, no, I'm so sorry for your loss for your mother. No, it's all about them. I want to show you my kid. I want to show you my son. I want you to be a part of my life. Because what, sh what they are wanting is for me to send gifts and presents and money and feed their drug habits. And I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And you're not going to take my life away. I've been on my own, away from those people, no contact for 15 years. My life is good. I was in a freaking motionless and white music video, man. I got to work with Elvira. Like, I don't know how much better it can get. Like, it's gonna. It's gonna get better. But that's if I decide to get back up, right? Like, if I decide to stay down and bury myself, it's all over. I just got to do a Black Veil Brides, you know, collaboration with Curse Cosmetics. Like, I, I, I can't let these people ruin me. Last October, I started studying dark psychology and I started learning how people manipulate you and it just came full force with my family. And um, and then I was gonna quit. Um, but it was almost like, you know, I have this friend who has a quite a big following on social media. She lives in um, Australia and she is a divine feminine and she talks about on her, I, I'm friends with her in her personal life, but she teaches you know, balancing your feminine, your dark feminine, light feminine, and then also your masculine energies. And she told me on the phone one day, she was like, you know, you've been in your feminine energy since like December. And she's like, it's time to bring some of your masculine back out. You have to even it out now. She goes, you know, masculine qualities are setting firm boundaries, you know, speaking the truth, communicating, and having, you know, dedication, perseverance, and being committed to something. So she goes, if you're committed to Ghost Girl Diaries, 
you have to just cut these people out and not allow them to affect you anymore. And I said, I agree. So it was really strange because as all of this was happening, which was like February to May, you know how I've been having all of these like predominant dreams where I can communicate with my guides. They cut me off. They cut me off. I had no communication with them from February to May. And I was panicking. I was like, did I do something wrong? Like they're not talking to me. They're not communicating. I was getting answers instantly. I would go to sleep that night and I would have a dream. I was with my guides and I was having this meeting. And all of a sudden, I think what they were teaching me, by the way, was to just trust my own instincts. I don't have to always rely on them. Whatever you decide, you know, you trust your own instincts. You don't have to constantly go to us for guidance. And I really needed that reassurance. So they sort of like cut the cord with me with that. But then all of a sudden I woke up in mid-May. It was just a random, random day. I woke up with a full, like, I guess you could call it psychic medium abilities. I don't know what else to call it. And I feel like I'm crazy saying that because I've never experienced this before. I don't know what's happening. I was very upset and confused at first. It took me a couple of months to understand the gifts that I had been gifted. I could hear my guides audibly. I could immediately ask a question in my head and I could hear them as if they were standing right next to me. And because I've been having these predominant dreams for two years where I'm talking to my guides, I knew each one. I knew exactly who was talking when they were talking. I feel like I'm going to start crying. When, it, when I woke up, and I, you know, and I just all of a sudden had mediumship abilities, right? It was loud. It was horrible. It was like you have a radio station on full blast all day, 24/7. But it wasn't like it was like mumbly, like it was clear, crystal clear. And I was like, but it was like I could hear four of them talking at once. I could hear them having conversation. I was like, am I losing it? Like, am I going crazy? Like, what is going on? And I would talk to them and ask a question and like, I remember the first day when I woke up in the morning, it was so loud and I was like, what the hell? Like, is there a television on? Like, am I losing it? And I asked a question and I heard my guide say, welcome to your new timeline. And it was loud and it was like almost piercing loud. And I like jumped and I looked around the room because it was so clear. I, I was like, do I need to sage my house? Like, I don't know what I need. Like, and they're like, you need to calm down. They were talking me through it. Like, you need to calm down. You know, you don't have to dream about, you know, asking us questions anymore. You can, you can communicate directly now. And I was like, okay, it's loud. Can you turn it off? Like, and they're like, you're going to have to figure out how to do it. And I couldn't. It took me months. It took me months to like, it's like a radio station. I have figured it out now. But you have to tune into certain radio frequencies and shut it off. But when it first happened, it scared the living crap out of me because it was loud 24 seven. I, and I mean, like my guides were loud and like, I just could hear constant talking. I was like, I'm losing it. I'm going to go to the, to the loony bin. Like, this is insane. I don't know what I'm experiencing. I actually stopped driving for like four or six weeks because it was so loud. I was scared to get in my Jeep and drive because I didn't want to wreck because I, I was like, it was so loud. I was like, what if I can't hear a siren? Like it was that bad. So eventually I was able to figure out how to turn it off and then turn it on. I can literally turn it off and turn it on. And I started, you know, talking to my friends about it and they asked me to read them essentially. And I started reading my friends and they were like, holy crap, how do you know all of this? And I was like, I don't know. I can just hear it coming to me. I can hear information just flooding, flooding in. And I'm just saying what I hear. I ended up going into a, uh, an organic dog food store that's here in um, Summerlin in Vegas. The woman must have sensed I was like had abilities. But remember, this is when I'm really new to my abilities and like I'm still not familiar with how they work. So this woman came up to me and I was looking at dog food and I was trying to decide you know, a brand or whatever. She hands me a picture. And it's a picture of her and her dog, uh, I'm sorry, of her, her father and her dog. And I hold the picture and I was like, oh, at first I was like, oh, this is so sweet. Like, who is this? Because I was like, why is she handing me a random picture? And next thing I know, I'm having a full blown like Long Island medium episode. I, I wish I could explain what happened. And this is where I struggle with this podcast and how to put it into words. I believe what happened was my higher self stepped in and I sort of took a back seat in my body 
and my higher self started just channeling all this shit about this woman's dog and her dad. And I, I'm channeling like that the dog wanted to take the cancer away from him and um, like he would have done that to like save the human and like he was very like I mean I had this woman in tears okay and like I had no idea what was going on because the, the information's coming out and I can't stop so that's how I felt like I was almost like not in control of it it was like this all this inf specific detailed information by this time there's like three other workers have come around this woman I end up finding out she's like the owner of the business and she's bawling her eyes out and hugging me and thanking me profusely. I just literally channeled her dad and her doc. I know that some of you are gonna be like, oh, that was so cool. And some of you are gonna be like, how did you do it? No, let me tell you how it felt. I felt immense guilt over it. I felt horrible. I felt like shit, if I'm putting it honest. I left, I bought my stuff, I scurried out of there. Eventually I came to, I came back where I was in control. And I left and I went and sat in my Jeep and I cried for like 30 minutes. And I screamed at my guides. I was so angry with them because I had this woman in tears and it felt evasive. It felt so invasive. I felt guilty and it felt invasive. And uh, although the woman was happy, she was hugging me. She, she, I gave, I healed her. I gave her, I mean, she was like over the moon at what just happened. I did not feel that way. I felt like I just overstepped a major boundary and I didn't even mean to. And I don't even know how that happened. And then my guides were like, you had to know how powerful you are now. And that was the only way that we could test it was by doing it with a stranger. You've got to trust that the messages that are coming through are real. And this is the only way that we could prove it. And I said, fine, don't ever do that again without my permission. Don't ever do that again without my permission because that freaked me the F out, okay? So... I got a little weird after that and I didn't really want to go to a lot of public places for a few weeks because I was like, I don't want to just start channeling to people. I love Teresa and Long Island Medium, but I don't want to be her, okay? And so then I had a dream. My dream started coming back and my guide said, okay, we need to know what do you want to use this gift for? Do you want to channel people? Do you want to have, like, you know, do you want to, what do you want to do? And I was like, no, I don't. I want to use this for communicating with the other side. And they were like, okay, that was what the original purpose was. They were like, I, I, I asked them, I said, can you just take this gift away? Like, I just don't want this gift. I just don't even want it. And they were like, nope, we can't take it away. It was always meant to happen this way. And they were like, you wrote this in your, um, your blueprint before you got here, so it is what it is. And they were like, you're the same on the other side, so why, if you're, by you not accepting this gift means you're not accepting who you truly are, so don't complain about it. Um, so it took me a few months to get comfortable with this, and I'm still not fully comfortable. Uh, to, to use this gift with the living is very uncomfortable for me, to be honest. I am seeing things fully. I can see apparitions, like a full apparition standing there. I can see, in fact, I had to put up a boundary with my guides and say, do not show them to me in their state of death because it's traumatizing and so yeah I just had a lot of changes I had a lot of changes with my abilities I did not know I was gonna end up here I did not know I was gonna end up with full medium abilities but here we are I was just getting lessons and lessons over and over and over again until these abilities came in so to me it was almost like from February to May I had to pass all these lessons I was getting the same lessons over and over like this over like you know different people same lessons and boundaries and like trusting my intuition it was like Finally, I pass all the tests, and they're like, okay, she can have her abilities. She's passed the tests. Um, it was a very stressful time. I ended up going to Colorado um, the first week of May to bury my parents, and that was really difficult. I also met with a um, realtor, and I was approved for a home loan, so I'm looking currently for a house. I don't know where I'm going to be. At. I don't know where I'm gonna end up. I'm looking currently in Vegas and New York. Uh, I like the Sleepy Hollow area is kind of an outskirts of Sleepy Hollow. Um, I went to Colorado to look at houses, decided not to go back. I had a lot of my really close friends from my childhood and they were like, you've outgrown this place, you can't come back. And I, I felt the same. So I won't be returning to Colorado. I, I have about six months to make a decision on purchasing a house and um, so I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I'm going to stay in Vegas or not, but 
Um, I mean, of course, I'll take you guys on the journey with me if I do decide to leave, but it's going to be a major, major life change if I do go to New York. I do have um, a support system there, so it's another reason that I would go there. Also, you'll have a support system in Vegas, but um, I just can't decide what to do. So I'm currently looking for houses, so we'll see where I end up. I really got connected to my soul family for the past six months, and this is people that, um, you know, are people you've probably reincarnated with many, many times. And I did have some of my close friends come back in my life that left my life in February. They came back in and, and apologized. But it's interesting because I feel like I had this major ascension, this major level up with um, energetically who I am as a person. I'm very, very sure of myself. I'm very sure of who I am. And I've never been in this position of power of where I know exactly what my future looks like. I know exactly, I mean, as far as like, you know, Ghost Girl Diaries is still in pursuit. And on my birthday, which is May 10th, I had a really dear friend fly out from Dubai for my birthday. I've known him since we were like seven or eight. We both experienced the loss of our friend Derek who killed himself when we were 13. And it's weird because you know we stay in touch like anytime something happens in my life he's the first person to text me and he lives in freaking Dubai like he literally lives 12 hours in the future and he'll be the first person to text me you know and um, like he lives literally on the other side of the planet and he, he came into Vegas to see me and he's Muslim his family actually escaped Gaza when they were like I think in the late 80s early 90s and uh, so he's Palestinian and we're very close. He's one of my best friends. We've never really gotten into the, the conversation about life and death and my soul family. You know, it's, it's going back to that theme that I've experienced in my soul tribe. And he said, you know, I want to talk about Derek's death. I want to hear like your opinions on it. I gave him a signed book and, uh, you know, one of my books. And I was like, no, 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 you're Muslim, and I understand, and I respect your religion, and I would never try to disrespect that. Like, we've known each other too long. We grew up very privileged. You know, I've said that before, but I really mean it. Like, we grew up with Vietnamese kids and Hispanic kids, and I was indigenous and white kids and, you know, Mexican kids, and, like, every every color under the sun, he's Muslim. Like, um, and we all grew up very close, and, I mean, although it was the suburbs of Denver, um we just grew up very, very sheltered. And we learned, even through our, the eyes of our parents, to respect each other, respect each other's culture. And then as we got older, we, we got shell-shocked because we realized how much hate happens in the world. And my closest best friend's soul tribe is from elementary school. And we are from all different nationalities and all of us just can't understand the hate that goes on because we just didn't grow up that way, you know? And so anyway, I said, no, I don't, I don't want to disrespect, you know, your, your religion. I don't want you to ever think I was like stepping on your toes. And he's like, no, I want to hear your thoughts and opinions. It was like a therapy session and it was like the therapy session I needed. He said that Derek, I, in my book, if you've read my book, I talk about Derek was one of the really strongest predominant uh, energies I've experienced on the other side and in the gray zone and that he would visit me in dreams and tell me he wasn't going to cross over uh, because his sister found him hanging and he wasn't going to cross over until his sister go goes to the other side essentially and Hassan had the same dreams and we've never talked about it all these years and Hassan was like you know in, in the Muslim religion you believe that you know if you commit suicide you go to hell and he's like that's bullshit he's like I don't believe that and it was just really, really, I, I, it was like I was at home, you know, like he's married and has kids, but we're still very close. We're still best friends. You know, he's like a brother to me. If I ever remarry, I might ask him to actually walk me down the aisle again because um, he's just known me, you know, longest, so one, one of my longest friends. And that's how I view him is like like a sibling since I've known him since we were so little. It was just a really therapeutic healing conversation we had about the other side and we and we were crying, we were hugging, we were crying, you know, like um, I think he felt validated too knowing that we both experienced the other side with Derek. Hassan said something so funny to me. He said, you know, I've known this guy since I was eight so when we look at each other I think we still see the children in each other's eyes, you know, and he goes, I'm not shocked at all that you became a producer. And I was like, 
really? Like, why? Did I always give that hint? And he was like, yeah, you did. I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, you always controlled the talent shows. He goes, I remember in elementary school, you're, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, running the production. And he goes, <laughs> I'm dying laughing because I just, I forgot. Like, you know, once again, he sees me as this younger version of myself. You know, he goes, I remember being like nine years old looking at you being like, how does she even know how to do that, man? Like, he's like, you'd have a checklist and you'd have like, <laughs> which is such a producer thing to have like, you know, uh, you know, a list and like you're going around telling everybody what time they need to be on stage. And he's like, I would look at you and be like, how does she know how to do this? Like, I didn't, he's like, every year consistently you were running the talent show. We were in the talent show. He was always in the sh talent show with me. He did one year. I was Jasmine and he was Aladdin. Um, I think that was third grade. And another year we did another talent show, which was, um, we did Rock Around the Clock, which is a 50s song, uh, and dance, and he was my dance partner, and uh, we did a 50s dance, I got to wear a poodle skirt, and I, and I choreographed the whole thing, I was always into dance, as you guys know, and um, he was like, yeah, I knew you were going to be a producer, he's like, that was just like who you were as a kid, and I was like dying, because it was like, I forgot, like I didn't even remember that I was like involved with that, you know, because I was always on stage with my dancing and singing and my bands and stuff. And uh, it was really, really healing. I kind of told him what was going on as far as, like, my family. And he was like, dude, you've come too far. He's like, you wrote a book, bro. He's like, not many people can say they wrote a book. He's like, you've won, like, what, six or eight film festivals? He's like, you won, you won money for them. You're, like, best director, best documentarian, paranormal investigator. You've been on television how many times? He's like, you've worked with Motionless and White. You've worked with Elvira. He's like, you can't stop now. He's like, you can't, he's like, I don't want to hear any excuses. And it was just like, it was like what I really needed because he is like family and it does feel isolating when you're an only child and, and both of your parents die. It feels, and especially for me being so isolated from my family, I know I have really good friends, you know, I know I'm surrounded with a good community and, and a good support system, but it's just different when your parents are gone and he's somebody that I respect enough that I know would step in and like sort of slap the shit out of me and that's that's what he did that day and um so it was it was a great meeting to be with him then after he left after my birthday that was when i woke up with these abilities my guides told me i need to vibrate at such a high level that i can't allow anything to phase me anymore and they said that i have to allow everything to fall away because I'm at a, a vibration, an ascension, after going through the experience, you know, walking through the shadow side, walking through hell, walking through the death and rebirth of my mom's murder and healing and coming out the other side, they were like, nothing can phase you. So stop, like, don't let anybody, even your family, if that's the last bit that you have to, like, get rid of as far as haters, they were like, you have to learn to just nothing's shocking nothing's sad it just is and just vibrate high and i said you know i don't i told my guys i don't want to upload this video i don't want to upload a video at all i, I just want to go away and they're like why and i said because i don't want my family to watch and they were like why and i said because they're haters like they're putting me down like i don't want them to inspect everything i say i don't and they said wait a minute wait a minute stop they said you're on a path to fame they said this is something you were always destined for and they said even when you are triggering your haters, whether that's fans and people that absolutely hate you, people that watch you, or even family, they said you are still doing them a service. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, if they are watching you, they are trying to get on your frequency. They're trying to get on your level. If they are inspecting everything you say, and they're taking back and, and running and writing a blog about it or a vlog and talking crap about you, and every time you do an upload, they're watching your every move. You are still triggering them in a good way. Because my guide said, they see something within you they wish they could see within themselves. They are mirroring you. So you are still helping them ascend, whether you know it or not, with haters. And they said, you have to still continue to progress forward, even with people hating on you because they are trying to meet you at your level. They don't understand why you're living this life of getting everything you want and obtaining everything you want because you're vibrating at such a high level with ascension 
they don't understand why they can't do that too and my guide said they can they just have to ascend higher and the first step is sort of stop you know divulging in low level stuff like gossip making up stories writing blogs online whatever talking crap like my family and they said so you're still helping them ascend but they said whatever you do with the information like if, if you're sitting there on camera my guide said this to me verbatim they said if you're on camera and you're talking about something you went through and you're teaching an ascension lesson and somebody comes along and they take that lesson the wrong way they they skew your words and manipulate it they said that's none of your business they said once you you blurt out the information and you give your you know soul tribe your information of what you've gone through what you're going through or teaching them how to connect with the other side they said what they do with that information is none of your business my guide said if you have haters if you have fans if you have family that's coming on to hate you and they don't understand what you're saying that is none of your business if they choose to take the information you you gave and manipulate it and do something else with it that is none of your business they are still a part of your soul tribe and I was like oh okay so I just kind of took a seat after that and I decided to not allow my family to affect me anymore you sort of have to be in this energy of maintaining like constant contact between your third eye and your, your crown chakra like everything I do anymore I'm always connected up here like you know even when I'm out in public like I someone can like I was getting those messages before where I could hear people's thoughts randomly or so, so I, I feel like my guides were showing me the direction this was gonna go to like eventually I was gonna step into mediumship abilities but I did not expect to just wake up one day with those abilities um, so it's been definitely um, a learning curve I'm, I'm better now like I'm I'm focused but I did not want to come on here and make a video while that was going on because I wasn't even sure how to explain it I wasn't even sure if I could control it I didn't know what was happening um, so I'm just kind of in a new era of what Ghost Girl Diaries is going to be I think it's going to be me being able to connect with them on a psychic medium level which actually makes me really happy because you know my biggest goal in paranormal if you've watched like any of my documentaries is teaching people that the other side exists is teaching people that it's not always dark and teaching people that sometimes these souls need help crossing over sometimes they don't know they're dead majority of the time 98 percent of the time you're gonna run into a soul that does not know that they're deceased they're they're stuck in the gray zone and I've always wanted to be a person of the light that could help them through that and I think this ability is now going to be able to help obtain that goal I want to do another podcast where I teach you guys how to connect to your higher self. I've actually been, I've been guiding and sort of mentoring some of my close friends on it. And if they can accomplish it, then you can. So I'm going to do that in a separate video. Just know that we all have destiny and free will. I had this dream with my guides and I walked into this room and there was like a person and they were very busy and they were running this almost like round circle conveyor belt it's huge in this room like probably like a six foot six foot room and this big belt and it was going and going and going and going around and around like a treadmill and I said except it was thin you know looked like a train track and I said what is this and they said it's your fate the fates are involved everything that you've ever wanted everything that you dreamed manifested ghost girl diaries that's your fate that's that's your end goal it, it's real it exists you just have to get on that timeline and I said oh so the fates exist oh yeah everyone has the fates the fates are on their side they exist so they said this is your room of fate this is your lifetime currently that you're in a fate and I said so what how does it work so the guy steps out from the machine and he stops the wheel and he goes you can stop it you can add things on it you can take things away you can make it go faster, you can slow it down, but the only thing you can't do is reverse it. And I said, so does that mean you just can't go back in time? He goes, so learn to live in the now. You can change and manipulate anything you want in your future. You can make it better, you can make it worse. It's all up to you, it's in your hands. Destiny is in your hands. You just can't go backwards. So time is of the essence. Le like, literally, I saw my wheel of fate running and how much time I have left on this earth to accomplish what I need to accomplish. And I think that's what something a lot of people don't get. Like, how do you obtain wealthy status? How do you obtain millionaire, billionaire status? How do you become a famous person? Whatever your end goal is, it doesn't even have to be famous. 
it's that people focus on what they want and they don't worry about what el else is going on outside of it. You know, it's like self-discipline. It's sort of stepping at, it's sort of stepping into that masculine side of I'm disciplined enough to not worry about what's going on around me to be able to focus on my fate and they do exist. So I just thought that was really important something for you to um for you to lo to learn. My, I want to just give you one message that my guides gave me before I go. And one of the last things they said to me before I did this podcast was, You don't realize how strong you are. If you knew who you were on the other side, you would never speak to yourself like that again. And I said, does that, does that fit for me or for everyone? And they said, everybody. So don't speak to yourself negatively. Um, that you really are the vibration of what you attract. Remember in February, February I told you guys that I was thinking something, it was showing up, that's still happening. It's still happening. It's it's worse now. Like, I can think something and the next... Now, remember, when you're manifesting and you're high, you're on a high vibration level, you're not talking down to yourself, you're not, you know, you don't have negative thoughts running through your head, you're not doubting yourself, right? When you're vibrating at a high level, sometimes it still takes the 3D a little bit of time to catch up, right? So, so sometimes my manifestations are really big and they don't come in immediately, they come in a couple of days later. So I'll talk to you guys about that next in the next podcast. But I just hope that you're still working on remembering to eliminate negative thought processes because that's the only way you're going to get to your highest timeline of, of your fate, your wheel of fate of what you're wanting to accomplish. So you know, the last thing was, is do I return to social media? And the answer is, yeah, I do. Um, Ghost Girl Diaries is just going to be me for a while. I really like Bailey Sarian's layout and how she kind of does it on her own. And I think there's a, there's a lot of floods with podcasts right now. So we need to be a little bit careful, um, you know, not to just sort of get lost with like having all these guests and all that stuff. So I'm going to do it a little bit different. I really like the new layout that I had um, of the werewolf one that I did for the werewolf, the Rougarou in Louisiana. But that's where I've been for the last six months. It's been a lot of negotiations back and forth on trying to decide if I was going to come back or not. And I decided to not let these people win. The next big thing I'm about to face though is where am I going to move? I don't know if I'm staying in Vegas. I'm either going to be in Vegas or I'm going to be in New York. and. I'm facing some major changes in my life, so hopefully you guys will be there with me for it. I hope everyone's doing wonderful and beautiful, but it's time to pick up and keep going, okay? I took a few years off. There's no more time off now. Now it's go time, baby. Oh.